Yes. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the 2022 IARPIC or Interagency Arctic Policy Committee post field season meeting. My name is Cynthia Garcia Idel, and I'm a Canals Marine Policy Fellow supporting the Arctic Research Program at NOAA. I'm also supporting the Interagency Arctic Policy Committee, or IARPIC, and I'm joining this call from the ancestral home of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are very excited to, to host this year's meeting, uh, recapping the 2022 Arctic research field season, where we will have our Arctic going researchers uh, share their unique early findings, the challenges they encountered, as well as their important community outreach and local engagement activities. So many thanks to all of our speakers today who volunteered to share their work with the community. Oh, so just to briefly share some reminders here. Um, so this meeting is being recorded and we will make this recording available in our IARPIC event page, as well as our YouTube channel uh, by next week. As always, please stay on mute when not speaking or asking questions. Uh, we, you, we all probably know where the mute and unmute button is located by now. It's at the bottom left, right? And But for those joining by, in by phone, you can mute or unmute by pressing star six. Uh, to change your name, um, you can just go to participants and hover, hover over your name and click rename. And we would encourage all of our speakers, our invited speakers today, to please rename um, and add your institutions next to your name. So our, our, our participants would know uh, where your institutions, right? Uh, for those, um, and, and then also, um, we encourage the use of our chat, our chat function for asking questions as well as for making comments. We all know where the chat uh, button is by now. Um, lastly, if you want to, you know, uh, verbally ask your questions, uh, please virtually raise your hands. So you, we all know where that is. So reactions and then press raise your hands. For those on the phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine. Um, and then if you raised your hand, please wait for the moderator or or the facilitator to acknowledge you before unmuting. I also want to mention that this meeting falls within the IARPIC's code of conduct, right? So I will drop that link or my colleague here, Meredith, will drop the link in the chat. We want to do everything we can to create a safe, productive, inclusive, and welcoming meeting. So if at any time there's something that we will make you more comfortable, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Meredith. Uh, and we encourage all of our meeting participants to come uh, and enter with an open mind and respectful of the diverse perspectives and knowledge systems represented on this call. Uh, lastly, here are some helpful links about IARPIC. That's our, the IARPIC website as well as our different social media platforms. We, and now I will turn it over to Renee Crane, who is the co-chair of the IARPIC Field Operations Community of Practice. Thank you, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 post field season meeting. I'm Renee Crane. Uh, many of you know me, but as background, I'm a program manager in the Arctic Sciences section at the National Science Foundation. Um, and, and to give my land acknowledgement, I live and work on the ancestral lands of the Manahoac and Powhatan people. I honor and recognize the place-based knowledge and ancestral and contemporary stewardship of indigenous peoples of their homelands, including here and in the Arctic. And just a few words about our meeting today. I want to thank all of our presenters for contributing to this meeting and to the pre-field season meeting that we held in July. I want to thank our co-sponsors from the Marine Ecosystems and Sea Ice Communities of Practice, and thank my collaborators David and Cindy for helping to put together today's meeting. Um, the Field Operations Community of Practice, or the FOG, the Field Operations Working Group, as we were historically known, is uh, a self-forming team whose goal is to bring together knowledge and good practices around all things having to do with field work. And um, today's meeting goals are to communicate across the research project funded by different agencies and different nations to improve research collaborations and outcomes. And this includes all kinds of outcomes, both the scientific outcomes and the field logistics outcomes, outreach outcomes. So we're gonna touch on a lot of things today. And we also want to use this opportunity to communicate to coastal communities 
and other interested groups about the research being conducted and the research results. Um, we want to develop these pre and post field season meetings to build on our ability to collaborate with communities in the Arctic and other interested groups. So we want it, we want this to be in addition to attending the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission meeting and other outreach that people do about their projects with communities in the Arctic. And I'll now turn it over to my co-chair, David, to introduce more about the flow of today's meeting. David, you're still muted. Thanks to my co my co lead and uh, to Cindy and to Meredith for um, for being the maestros, um, making all of this uh, making all this possible. It's been really fun uh, collaborating. And um, Cindy, as I've already said, uh, Cindy and Meredith, as I've already said to you, it would not be possible without you. So thank you so much. Um, my name is David Allen. Um, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today. I'm a program manager with NOAA's Arctic Research Program and co-lead of the Field Operations Working Group. I'm joining this call from the ancestral home of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples here in Washington, DC. Um, if we can, oh, yes. Um, as a reminder, um, we hosted the pre-field season meeting on June 27th. Um, it was an opportunity to share field season plans across projects and to generate collaborations and mutual awareness. Um, as, as most of you know who are uh, working in the field, um, uh, we, have, we have lots of plans and almost never uh, do they go exactly as we plan. So uh, this collaboration and cooperation is sort of part of your DNA, but, um, but this was an opportunity to sort of facilitate those discussions and, um, and advance them even further and share them with a broader community. Um, so that, um, that June 27th meeting was uh, intended to communicate those, um, those community, uh, those cruise plans with coastal communities and other interested groups. Um, and I'll just note that um, as, as the slide says here, the recording is available at the link below and um, we will post that in the chat uh, for folks who were not able to participate uh, in that initial meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as a reminder, uh, here's a list of the PIs um, and, uh, and associated projects that uh, gave presentations at the pre-field season meeting. Um, uh, it, was a really, uh, it was a really exciting meeting. I think it was probably too densely packed. Um, so that's, uh, that's why our plan uh, sort of came together for today. Um, I won't read through uh, the entire group, but I highly recommend um, folks who did not participate in that meeting to avail themselves of the, uh, of the recording, as well as the additional resources that, um, that we developed with the IARPIC Secretariat um, to support this activity. Um, it's, um, I think it was really a, a massive advance compared to what we had done in the past. Um, and that's thanks to all the folks that were able to contribute to it. Um, so for today, um, this is a list of all of the folks uh, that are uh, that will be presenting. Um, it's useful to keep this list in mind. Um, uh, we'll have to figure out some way to sort of have it hanging in the background for you. Um, but this will this will be the list and the order of presentations that will follow uh, throughout the remainder of today's session. Um, I will note that it is a slightly different group, um, uh, but uh, but quite an excellent group of uh, presenters and PIs. Um, that uh, that includes both crewed and uncrewed, uncrewed research missions that span from the Bering to the Beaufort, as well as into the Central Arctic uh, Central Arctic Ocean. So we're really excited to have um, the group um, that we have uh, represented here today. Um, and just a reminder, um, if you can go to the next slide, um, we chose a different format today again to promote. Um, uh, to both show um, show connections between all the different projects, as well as to promote uh, discussions and questions uh, and answers. Um, the themes that we chose uh, for today were um, an initial overview and significant findings. Um, then we wanted to talk about uh, wanted everyone to talk about the the challenges that they encountered while they were uh, while they were in the field. Um, and uh, the the presentations cover a really wide span of really interesting uh, interesting findings. Um, and I should note in that overview and significant findings, um, this is science, um, and these are very, uh, very early uh, initial findings because there's a, a long process that's that's involved in actually processing all of the data that that are collected on these uh, on these different missions. Um, again, after that, we'll go through challenges encountered, and then finally, we'll talk about um, community engagement uh, and outreach activities both before. 
uh, during uh, during research activities and after um, uh, after those research activities uh, were concluded. Um, each pro each uh, project will present on a topic, um, and then that will be followed by a discussion. And the intent uh, behind all of this is that we'll synthesize the information across the projects, and that will yield um, uh, better uh, better planning for future research and communication. And finally, uh, we really hope um, that seeing these projects and their initial findings together, as well as all of the other topics, will really allow uh, for greater insights about the, um, the current state of the Arctic. Next slide, please. So with this, um, I will say thank you to all the pre uh, presenters and uh, participants for joining us and remind everyone to keep their presentations as brief as possible so that we can allow for um, hopefully a rich, um, uh, rich questions and uh, discussions period. I will now turn to the first uh, person in our uh, presentation group. Um, it's a, a combined presentation, both with Karen Ashton, who will, I think will be the main presenter, but also um, with, uh, with Jackie Grebmeyer, who will follow. Um, and then we'll just jump uh, jump straight through the list. So Karen, if I can turn the mic over to you and uh, and thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna just talk briefly about our recent cruise um, on the Coast Guard Cutter Healy. This is the cruise, it's part of the US, the US contribution to the Synoptic Arctic Survey. And um, on our cruise, it was a multidisciplinary cruise from September 4th to October 24th. Um, we were sampling aspects of the physical carbon and ecosystem um, systems. Um, and we included for the ecosystem plankton, benthos, and marine mammals and birds, as well as some microorganisms. The figure on the right shows our cruise track. We had two transects that ran from the shelf to the pole and then back again. We also did a couple of high resolution surveys on the shelf break, one at the beginning of the cruise going across um, a transect that ran from the Hannah Shoal across the shelf break the, that has been sampled before and another one um, in Hannah Canyon and we turned over a mooring. We did 51 stations altogether. Um, the long stations, which we were doing in the basin could take up to 18 to 20 hours because of the depth of the water and putting benthic things down there takes a long time and CTDs and, and nets down to 2000 meters, it all takes many hours. So. We ended up doing a, a long station every other day and augmented those with short stations in between and um, CTDs and XCTDs and XBTs. And the project has been funded by the National Science Foundation. We had some additional support from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who, who um, sent a participant along to do bird surveys and the NPRB. And I think that's, I don't remember if there's another slide or not. Yes. Um, some unique observations that we saw um, from our these are initial results was first we were really surprised that there were a lot more more leads and the ice was much thinner than we had expected. This photograph on the left shows um, a big lead that we saw at 89 degrees north, so that's only um, 60 miles from the North Pole on September 30th. So that was a bit of a surprise. We'd find these highways sometimes. Well, we found few or no seabirds or marine mammals in the Central Arctic, and looking at the data, I see, think it's basically north of the ice edge. And we found in terms of physical oceanography, you can see there's a section on the bottom right. This shows temperature in the upper 100, uh, 500 meters um, going from the shelf to the pole. The pole is located on the right-hand side of the figure. We found warm water extending at about 50 meters quite far to the shelf, uh, north of the shelf, off the towards the north, up to 85 degrees north. And also the pinkish shades near the bottom part, um, that's the Atlantic water, and that shoaled as we moved from the shelf to the basin, being at about 200 meters once we got to the North Pole. Okay. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, and lots, of, lots to think about. Um, I'll turn to Jackie now, please. Sure. Thanks, uh, David, and all of you, and nice, Karen. Um, so I'm going to give you a, just a brief out on the July Sir Wilfrid Laurier cruise as we do uh, our funding for the National Science Foundation. And we do this jointly with our Canadian colleagues on, the, uh, on their ship Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And I'll also present a few uh, couple just summary slides from a couple of the international cruises. But the, uh, the key details, uh, we are jointly with our Canadian colleagues on the Canada's Three Oceans. And we our cruise was in July. It's usually within the day around those times that you see every year. We've been doing this since 1998. Um, it serves as a change detection array and for consistent monitoring. And you can see these time series sites on the right photo here. 
Uh, the figure here, the, the greens are where we do full on station evaluations from physics to uh, 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 benthic camera optics, uh, as you can see on the core base sampling there. Uh, as part of the DBO, there's some standard core measurements that are done, and then they get added on by whoever, what their cruises are doing. But we have a composite uh, work that we do with uh, our core scientists. Uh, we do optical measurements, and then that data is shared with NASA for looking of calibrating satellites. We do the standard uh, nutrients, chlorophyll, DOC, and DIC, uh, all the different plankton types. And then we focus on the macrobenthic abundance uh, the work that uh, I have a lead on and look at community structure, camera survey work that Lee Cooper does on the epifauna work. And then we combine with US Fish and Wildlife who usually put on uh, for seabird observations and marine mammals with uh, NOAA or, or the University of Washington or Canadian colleagues. And then we have underwater uh, underway surveys on that. And you can see some of the, the deployments that we have. Uh, you can see the vessel on the right there, and you can see some of the sampling we do on the uh, the lower pictures. And I just point out we have some of this to tighten up some of these uh, time series. We have CGD casts, so we can have sensors between some of the uh, the process stations and going from the south of St. Lawrence Island up to past uh, Utiavit. Next. So as far as uh, oh, what happened to my slide of uh, uh, key result? There should be another. Uh, I get, oh, there it is. Significant findings. I, I knew we found something. Um, I mean, these are our standard chlorophyll measurements. So you can really see the high standing stock, particularly uh, uh, north of Bering Strait here, um, but also up in the Northeast Czech GC. And these have been increasing over the years. And I would point out that if you just look at these in the July period, because we're getting the temporal, the seasonal lag now, it's in the later uh, seasons that we're seeing some of the higher, the, the changes going on and specifically, uh, the October cruise that we had uh, uh, combined with NOAA in 2021 on the Sekuliak, uh, no, excuse me, this is the Nance, this is the Norseman too. We saw in October really high levels in the fall. And that's what's happening. When we have these fall, October and November cruises as part of the DBO, we're seeing productivity still occurring, particularly uh, in some of these Southern stations. So the uh, shoulder months are becoming quite uh, informative. And on the right, I just one result from a, a a master's student that she just graduated and has a job. And that is the denitrification that we're seeing in the Southwest of St. Lawrence Island. And why this is important, because we're also seeing it in the Northeast Czech GC. Uh, this is as, hot, as part of these hot spots because it influences nutrient cycling. And in the particular for the DBO, these upstream changes that are going on in nutrients influence downstream in the Czech GC. Next, so that's just two points for that. Uh, the Oh, this is Rebecca's bearing straight more. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, go back to uh, Korea, Japan. Okay, Korea. So the Koreans I, have an annual cruise on the Iran and they're establishing or have established a monitoring system for looking at variations and what are the drivers for the environmental changes that they're observing. And they're putting these into numerical models uh, with their observing data. And you're seeing on the right here, they, they start in a, Korea and they end in Korea, so their cruises are quite long, especially uh, they do have a change out sometimes in Dutch or Nome, but uh, it's July to October. And you can see they do the DBO3 in the Southeast Chukchi Sea, then work primarily up in the Chukchi borderland where they've built their uh, observing system. And you can see on the lower left, some of their key measurements going through the standard from physics, atmosphere, a lot of atmospheric measurements, physics, chemistry, biology, and they've also included uh, geological structures and they've been working with the Canadians into the Beaufort on mapping. And on the lower right, that's the name of the big pro program, the Korean Arctic Ocean Warming in Response to the Ecosystem, funded by the Korean government. And you can see, go to this data site for where they put their data. Next. Uh, in Japan, through so, uh, Jamstech, this is their cruise. They do this annually in August through October on the Mirai. Um, the key project details that they outlined in our recent Pacific Arctic group meeting was that they have collaboration through the DBO, which is what I'm presenting here, and they also with the SAS uh, as, as related to what Karen gave for the previous presentation. On the right, you can see the figure where they're, uh, they're sampling. The lower right, you can see their actual measurements. The lower left are the activities going from physics to biochemistry. They do put a mooring and they re... re uh, redeploy the mooring and they bring it back out during these cruises. They've been practicing or 
putting in a water, they put an in-water drone, so autonomous vehicle that they're doing, doing measurements on plastic uh, surveys. And they also are looking at uh, through sediments and they have, um, they have done their presentations at the AWC, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, as we have done uh, our own programs and the ones also uh, presenting for the Koreans. So if you have any contact information, the lower slides have the, P uh, the chief scientist names and their emails. I think that's it. Awesome, thank you, Jackie. I'll turn to Rebecca Woodgate and uh, Cecilia Peralta Faris, please. Hello, so I'm Rebecca Woodgate from the University of Washington, Seattle, and with my colleague Cecilia, who's on the call here somehow, somewhere. Um, we're looking at the Bering Strait. This is an NSF Arctic Observing Network program. Um, it's been going for many years now. This last year, we had a um, about a nine, a eleven day cruise on the Norseman Two, extended one day because of the storm. It um, got a lot of bad weather on this cruise. We spent three days actually hiding out in Port Clarence. Um, most of the focus of this program is about mooring recoveries and deployments. We have long term moorings in the Strait. Um, since 1990, they've been measuring physical oceanography. Um, this year, we extended this to include bio optics, so nutrients, fluorescence, and oxygen. We're very excited about those measurements to give us some idea of what the seasonal cycle is in nutrients coming through the Strait and interannual variability. Um, this is funded through to 2000, 2026. We also do hydrographic sections, which you see on the on the map here. Um, and we're sampling those also for nutrients and in collaboration with a colleague at UW, Larry Jensen, we've been taking trace metal samples on those lines as well. And we are on underway data um, on the various lines. We usually go further up into the Chukchi than this, but very bad weather um, precluded that. Um, one of our moorings got moved um, a mile by the ice this year and we're still looking for one of the, one of the moorings which seems to have got moved further so all in all that meant our survey was only in the southern chukchi this time around next slide please um the main findings well obviously the data is still being calibrated but if we look at the annual means um for the total flow through the strait this is our best estimate of the transport on the top there the temperature and the salinity we find that um, though the transports are still increasing, um, this year, this last year was a comparatively low flow year, perhaps even more markedly in terms of temperature and salinity, the 2000, 2021 was much colder and much saltier than in recent years. So that's interesting and we're trying to tie that together to what's going on with the ice. I would say that the long term trends that we've seen for a while now, which is increasing volume, warming and freshening are still significant despite this one year being off that trend line. Okay, I'll stop there and hand it on to the next. Thanks so much. This is a really great findings. And um, if I understand correctly, we can talk about this more. Um, you're, you still have an all points bulletin up for your for that mooring that um, that got moved around. Is that correct? Yeah, and we will be we're looking into a, a, a taking us a, a better imaging system out with this this last year, next year, this year, this summer to to search for that mooring. So okay, I haven't so given we'll, up we'll, hope yet. We will find we will hopefully find it this year when folks go out in the field. Thank you so much. Um, Jim, I'll turn it over. Jim Murphy, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the, the Northern Bering Ecosystem uh, Service trial. Oh, yeah, good morning. Hopefully I can uh, make it uh, through this um, meeting without my video crashing. So I, I think I think I've got the technical difficulty sorted out. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about the survey we conducted in 2022. This this is kind of this Northern Bering Sea Ecosystem Survey is has been a survey we've conducted um, uh, for about uh, 20 years. So we missed a couple of years there. But the, the, the key focus of the survey obviously is, is surface trawl um, operations. That's kind of what distinguishes it to be different from many other surveys. Um, uh, an important part of the, the survey is to provide information on forage fish and, of course, salmon, and in particular, some of the, the issues that Western Alaska salmon populations are now facing. This has kind of brought a, a lot of the, the work we do on the survey um, more in the light and in, in focus of uh, marine issues in, in this region. Uh, we also conduct oceanographic observations, um, CTD, nutrients and, and zooplankton sampling with 
bongo nets on the survey. And in 2021, we started to add a, a benthic uh, ecology component. So we do beam trawl, three meter pump stack, beam trawl sampling, we do benthic grabs as well. And, and, uh, um, and we also uh, uh, partner with um, uh, Fish and Game um, in US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we bring seabird observers on, on vessel. So uh, yeah, I was this year uh, we had scientists from Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife First Service, and Alaska Pacific University, and we also hosted um, some uh, scientists through NASA on their carbon cycle research in, in, in the, for the Yukon River, and um, so we added that component to the survey this year. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, yeah, just kind of a bulleted list of, kind of a couple of things that uh, were uh, significant this year. Obviously, the uh, Typhoon Murbach happened during the middle of the survey. <laughs> so fortunately, we had most of the station sampled. So um, it just, we just lost a couple of days, but it didn't really impact the um, timing of uh, the stations uh, that we were sent because the, really the whole system would change completely. Um, just as Rebecca had mentioned, uh, we found temperatures uh, back close to somewhere near the long-term average that we've seen in the Northern Bering Sea. One of the things that we noticed this year, we do this rapid zooplankton assessment on the survey, and uh, we saw a pretty significant decline in the abundance of small copepod species. Um, overall, we just saw a low abundance of forage fish, uh, pretty significant decline in the abundance of chum salmon. We're still continuing to see this for abundance of the Um We added some work on ichthyophonus infections in the Chinook that we found fairly high rates of infection in ichthyophonus in Chinook salmon. And uh, this year we added a, uh, a distilled fat meter, and so we were studying the lipid content of salmon uh, real time on the survey. So those were kind of some of the interesting new things that we uh, accomplished on the survey this year. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jim. A lot to, a lot to think about as we're starting to see uh, messages about um, both physical, uh, physical drivers and, um, and biological drivers and change um, uh, as messages throughout this. Um, I'll turn it to Karen, um, Karen Ashton to talk about bowhead whale yeah. uh, research. I just want to interject that we do have to keep our pace a little bit faster. Each person should be spending about a minute on each slide and we can't commentate too much in between. So we'll have Karen, Emily, and Kyla as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so this for this project, it's we're looking at biophysical drivers of bowhead whale distribution. The goal is to better understand the factors governing the bowhead whale prey availability across the Beaufort Shelf. Um, this is a build on of a project that we've been working on in Barrow, and I think last year was our. 13th year of working in near Point Barrow. We did boat-based sampling from August 12th to September 2nd um, along these lines that you can see on the, the map using the 43-foot research vessel, the Annika Marie. And we sample hydrography in plankton and marine mammal distributions. Um, we also put out a short-term mooring, and then we also have three long-term moorings that are equipped with CTDs, ADCPs, AZFPs, and hydrophones to listen to whale um, vocalizations, and this is funded by the BOEM. Next, please. And this year, we found um, that the water at the Sentinel line that we all, we sample each year during the third week in August was still relatively cold, and late season meltwater was present, which suggests that the warmer water coming up into from the south in the ACC had not yet arrived at Point Barrow during that sampling. Based, based uh, just on our preliminary counts, it looks like the krill population was composed prized of larger, uh, older uh, juveniles and adults. And this is consistent with what we've been seeing um, for years when that warm water is delayed in arriving at Point Barrow. And the importance of this is our work is that local communities rely on subsistence bowhead whale hunting. And so it's important for them to understand and us to understand why the whales may or not may not be available in a, a given year, and also what the future um, what the future holds for bowhead whales under a climb uh, a changing environment. Fast enough. Spot on. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. I'll turn to you. 
All right. Um, so we are looking at marine sediment transport in Harrison Bay. We're trying to answer big questions related to after shoreline erosion, then what? And we're trying to find out where materials are going across the shelf. We completed the field studies for this project this year. This was our second major year of surveying on the RV Ukpik, which allowed us to get into shallow water. We successfully deployed six small moorings for about five weeks at the location shown in that top plot. And we fully recovered all of those at the end of the season and got great data sets from them. Um, through this project, we've collected a very detailed bathymetry data set. We've learned a lot about extremely diverse seafloor features. Um, and we'll hope to create a map, perhaps an interactive online map of all those. We've collected a lot of vessel-based hydrographic measurements, short gravity cores, and we were also able to get some chirp sonar lines um, this year with a very small, very low power chirp, which we're very excited about. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to a diverse array of seabed features, we're learning that there are very strong cross-shelf gradients in suspended sediment transport. We're seeing concentrations of several hundred milligrams per liter on the inner shelf, but those fade away by the time you reach the middle shelf. And we've been coupling this with morphodynamic modeling, and we've learned that over century to millennial timescales, different parts of the coast should be very, have very different sensitivities to the change in wave climate based on the pre-existing shelf morphology. And we're also learning that the Colville Delta looks a lot like some subtropical deltas, not because of wave climate, but because of ice. And we're excited to see how that changes in the next century um, as the ice decays, and we're working on modeling those changes. Thanks. Spot on. I'll turn to Kyla now, please. Hello, I'm Kyla for today. <laughs> Sorry, Kyla couldn't make it, so I might. Sorry, I, mean, I knew that you were you were presenting for this one. Sorry, Mike. No problem. Yeah, Kyla couldn't make it, so I'm part of this as well. It's called SASE Salinity and Stratification at the Sea Ice Edge. It was sponsored by uh, NASA through the NOP program. Uh, so um, the key project details with the, the goal was to basically do uh, salinity satellite salinity uh, validation and um, you know science as well. So understand the role of salinity and stratification uh, during sea ice freeze up. A um, lot of uh, measurements in near surface physics, just, just this past uh, late summer. And uh, the field work was based on a 30 day cruise um, from the RV Wallstad using a bunch of cool technology. Uh, next slide. So early uh, findings, uh, salinity was nearly uniform within the ice, but south of it, uh, there was a, a bunch of really interesting complex uh, variable uh, situation in salinity and temperature and other, other variables. And uh, again, the, uh, uh, one of the goals, um, besides a very important goal of salinity uh, validation from satellites, how close to the ice edge can we get uh, using these, uh, these satellites? Uh, another goal is uh, improved prediction of freeze up, um, uh, de uh, depending on both temperature and salinity. Okay, I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Bob, I'll turn to you, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so the name of this project was Phytoplankton Blooms in a Warming Chukchi Sea. Uh, it was a two-leg cruise on the RV Norseman 2. Uh, you can see the team of investigators there. The lead PI is Don Anderson from HUI. Um, the goals of the, oh, and it's funded by NSF OPP. Uh, the goals of the project to improve our understanding of phytoplankton dynamics in the Chukchi Sea, identify locations and quantify the magnitude of harmful algal blooms, uh, map the distribution of these uh, habsis in the sediments, and then to understand how uh, the physical drivers affect those things. And in terms of the field work, uh, we had our, our period of observation was mid July to early September. Uh, leg one, uh, focused primarily on HABs, and leg two focused primarily on biogeochemistry. Uh, we took a whole suite of interdisciplinary measurements of the water column and sediments. And I'd like to point out that we uh, did uh, real-time surveying uh, using an imaging floto cytobot to, to get the, um, the HAB concentrations near the surface, along with shipboard ADCP. Next slide. So here's our cruise track, uh, leg one, uh, we went from the Northern Bering uh, uh, up to Point Barrow. Uh, leg two, it wasn't quite as long, so we didn't have as, as, as extensive sampling, but we also uh, went further north on the Chukchi Shelf. Next slide. Uh, so we encountered and we tracked an, extent, an extensive harmful algal bloom. Um, here you see pictures of the concentration of uh, Alexandrium cantonella in color. Um, in, in the first leg in the beginning, we saw very high concentrations in the northern bearing. 
Uh, and then on our, on our way south on, on leg one, you can see up near um, Kotzebue Sound, some really high concentrations. Uh, they persisted in leg two. And then finally, uh, coming back down on leg two, you can see um, in Bering Strait, the concentrations were lower. And then uh, they were a little bit higher up near the, uh, the uh, central channel. So the whole thing was moving northward. So we have a lot of work to do to try to sort out this, uh, this bloom. Thank you. Okay, um, me again, sorry about that. Uh, so this is monitoring the Western Arctic boundary current and the changing climate. And uh, this is, uh, I'm, the, I'm the PI, and this is funded by um, the National Science Foundation um, Arctic Observing Network. Uh, the goals of the project, uh, we've maintained a long-term interdisciplinary mooring in, in the Beaufort Sea Boundary Current for, for almost 20 years now. Uh, and we carry out uh, biannual, biannual uh, hydrographic velocity tracer surveys of the Boundary Current, uh, extending from Bering Strait to the Canadian Beaufort. Uh, the field work this year, we had a 33-day cruise. It was late fall. Uh, we turned around to mooring, and we did a, a, a good number of high-resolution shipboard sections. And we also provided a platform for a bunch of ancillary programs that you can see there. Next slide. Uh, this is our cruise track. Uh, we did the mooring first, which is a black square uh, there in the western Beaufort. And then we steamed east in, in heavy ice and then worked our way back to the west and then finished the cruise in open water in the Chukchi. Next slide. Uh, in terms of our significant early findings, uh, we were out there during freeze up, which was really fascinating, and we saw active winter water formation on the Beaufort uh, shelf. On, on the left, you can see the ice concentration. It was nearly 100%. All the leads were freezing, so there was active winter water formation. And just as an example, the red, the funny looking red arrow that points to that section there, you can see uh, the temperature on top, uh, all that purple water is near the freezing point. So that's the winter water being formed. And below you see the salinity. Um, you can all, the, the noticeable point of, about that is that the inner shelf had the coldest and the saltiest uh, newly forming water. Uh, again, lots to do with these data. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. I'll turn to Mike Mike Steele, please. Okay, this is actually really me. So um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, something called MIST-3, multi-sensor improved sea surface temperature in the Arctic, phase three. There were as a MIST-1 and 2. Uh, so um, this is, um, oh, yeah. So this is uh, funded by NASA. And um, the idea is to improve both uh, gridded, um, sea surface temperature products um, around the world, but specifically in the Arctic. And uh, one of the highlights of this project was um, sail drone cruises uh, in the uh, Alaskan Arctic. Next slide. So what is a sail drone? It's uh, seven meters by seven meters, and it's got a bunch of stuff on it. Um, and in 2022, last summer, uh, this was what was on it. So atmospheric uh, sensors, uh, sort of surface sensors and subsurface ocean sensors as well. Um, it's uh, a sailboat, so it goes, uh, you know, several knots and uh, samples at uh, one to 10 minutes. Um, next slide. So uh, we had uh, sail drone cruises in 2019, where we tried to get as close to the ice as possible, 2021, where we just looked at correlation length scales. And this past summer, we thought we'd collaborate with the DBO. So we had two sail drones. One of them went back and forth on uh, DBO section three for uh, many days. And the other one went north of there and did sections four and five. Um, next slide. Yeah. So uh, early observations. Um, uh, we well, so the DBO is a collection. It's an awesome you know, program. It's a collection of one time sections over the field season by people who, who go up there. Uh, what we were able to do were repeat surveys, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for weeks or even months. So the, for instance, the DBO3 section, we did 25 round trips over 57 days. Next. And so, you know, here we see on that DBO3, gradual warming, gradual freshening, but then there's these uh, cool events where you get uh, warm, fresh layers, which normally you'd expect uh, to happen when there was a sort of a calm wind, but in fact, the wind wasn't calm during those times, so we need to look at that uh, some more. Next slide. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. Excellent. I'll turn to Mary Louise Timmermans, please. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about our cruise to the Canada Basin 
uh, region. We made it all the way almost to 80 north. Uh, here are the PIs up here, myself and, and uh, PIs at Woods Hole. This is a joint program with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So it's jointly funded by NSF and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And that's Bill Williams and Sarah Zimmerman. Uh, Bill Williams and Sarah Zimmerman this year were co uh, chief scientists on the cruise. You can see our cruise track on, on the right. We went counterclockwise around the basin because of ice and light conditions at the time. So in addition to CTDs and XCTDs and uh, an extensive suite of geochemistry, we deployed, we recovered and deployed three moorings shown in the squares there. And then we had three ice-based observatories, those are the stars, and we deployed two buoys in open water, which have now frozen up and are returning data. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just the, the, the suite uh, that we collected, the program components here, the basic idea of the cruise, the motivation of the cruise is to understand the change going on in the Beaufort Gyre region. And we can probably just go straight to the next slide to see some preliminary results. We've been uh, tracking freshwater content and heat content in, in this wind-driven gyre for the last 20 years under this program. This year, we saw a slight reduction in freshwater content as we saw the year before as well. And we're trying to understand why, what's changing in the system and uh, freshwater sources and so on. On the right is uh, heat content. And in general, we continue to see sustained increases in heat content, although we saw significant variability in heat in the halocline throughout the basin this year. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and finally, I'll turn to Luke Rayville um, to speak about the Arctic Mobile Observing System. And thanks yeah, for thank catching you. us up. Yeah, so just uh, a few words about this more uh, technology-centric experiment funded by the Office of, the Office of Naval Research. Uh, so uh, again, this is a big experiment, and there are, uh, for example, Lee Freitag at HUI uh, in the Acoustic Communication Group is a big part of this too. But uh, this summer, we're kind of in the second half of this four or five year project, and it's really about uh, developing these adaptive observing systems. Uh, so we had two cruises this year. Uh, we went in August uh, on Healy, and there we recovered some of the moorings from previous years and deployed eight moorings to really make the core of uh, the Amos uh, navigation array in the Beaufort Gyre, kind of in the northern central basin of the Beaufort Gyre. Also, Healy also deployed uh, several autonomous uh, vehicles and, and ice buoys. And then uh, a few weeks later, in, at the end of September in October, we went back on Sekuliak and uh, recovered some of the moorings, recovered a lot of the of, of the of the autonomous vehicles, and also did a lot of engineering tests, uh, really uh, testing and pushing the, the all of these systems and seeing all the how the components interact. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you see a little bit the vision of the uh, of this AMO system. It's really having all these components with uh, ice buoys and floats and drifters and small propeller AUVs that can activate and really, uh, and at the, at the bottom of the figure here, you see that kind of the catchphrase that the idea of having a scalable and a system that can respond to event and that we can communicate and has some kind of uh, uh, ways to coordinate the, uh, the, between the instruments. So this is kind of a long-term uh, development effort, uh, again, funded by the Navy with a lot of these motivations that you see on the right kind of trying to improve model, trying to improve our understanding of, of the Arctic environment uh, as it's changing, but really also using that system uh, for, uh, for science. And that's really kind of the exciting part. So uh, because we're also there testing these systems and collecting fantastic data, uh, we also have the opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to do science. For example, on the Sikola cruise, we did 50 CTDs, uh, full water comp and looking at, at really nice, uh, uh, frontal structure and our erosion. So we, we kind of collaborate with SASE and collaborate with other components. But uh, so again, this is kind of looking at that, uh, providing a really nice way forward to think about how we observe the Arctic. Thank you. 
Awesome. I'll turn to, uh, thanks so much for the presentations. I'll turn to Renee to um, to walk us through the Q&A. Um, and uh, thanks for catching us up for the last presenters, please. Yeah, do we want to um, end the screen share so we can see each other for a second? Or do people maybe want to look at slides, um, go back to some of the information to ask questions? You could do either way. But anyone who has a question, um, you can use the raise hand function. If you're on the phone, you can just chime in if you um, aren't able to raise your hand. And otherwise, you can also put questions in the chat. I see Danielle has a question for Jim. OK. All right. Questions for our presenters. Um, would you like me to voice my question, Renee? Yeah, go ahead, Danielle. I, I do have some, some also. <laughs> go, go for it, oh, Danielle. Sorry. Uh, uh, Jim, I was just wondering if during the NBEST um, survey, when you sampled the forage fish and the zooplankton, if you're doing lipid analyses on those to examine what sort of um, quality prey they might have provided to their predators, and, and if you're not doing it, are you, have you archived samples that somebody else might be able to use if they secured funding for that? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. We um, so we've monitored monitored the energy energy density. So not necessarily lipid, but it, it energy density does tend to follow lipid um, content, um, and so the, those will be analyzed. But it still would there would be opportunities for folks if they're interested in in diving deeper into kind of the status energetic status of these fish that um, they could work with uh, scientists here in the world. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, I, I like we divided our present our discussion up this way. We took the template slides that each of you presented and cut them up so we could really see across all the results instead of just seeing one presentation after another. And I'm not an oceanographer, but I am most certainly seeing a lot of people's projects kind of reinforcing projects in other areas and a lot of. Um, you know, for like the DBO, which has sort of point sampling, then there's a ton of information that's being collected on cruise transect in between and sail drones and other things. And so for me, I'm seeing a huge opportunity here um, to really knit together a picture of the oceanographic and, uh, you know, eco ecosystem changes happening from the Bering Strait through the Beaufort. Um, I see Bob Pickard has a question. Go ahead, Bob. Yes, thank, thanks, Renee. Uh, yeah, I agree. It, it, it's really impressive to see it this way with all the coverage um, and all the different uh, measurement systems. So uh, I, I'd just like to put out a, a, a plug that we've been trying to, uh, you know, assemble a database of shipboard ADCP data uh, for a number of years now. And so I have, you know, questions like, for instance, Jim Murphy's yeah. cruise. And I, he didn't say what ship he was on, but I, I guess it would be great if, if folks could reach out to, to me or we could put it on some sort of a, um, you know, a common site, which ships had um, shipboard ADCPs, because uh, we're interested in that. And we can also help with the processing, because I know it's not trivial to process some of these data. And and similar stuff can be said for the CTD data as well. You know, again, with Jim, I, I you know, you didn't say, but it'd be interesting to know if you had CTD data. So just, you know, a way to try to help, you know, mm -hmm. share, share the data. So Bob, are you able to get some of that from the Arctic Data Center? Uh, yeah, right, but but it's only across. It's only two thirds of it, or something. Well, and it's, there's also a big delay, right? And, yeah, right. And, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So it, it's in, <laughs> it's been complete, and it's not it's not yeah. the most effective. I, I'm finding the most effective way is almost through word of mouth at this point. Yeah, through that's not good. having a meeting like this, understanding, a meeting like this. It, reaching exactly. out to them. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And and I had a question along a similar lines, and there's a question in the chat about data. Um, for Jackie, in terms of the Korean and Japanese collaborators um, having access to the data from their cruises as well. Yeah, I would just say, like we have a requirement to put it into different multiple archives here in the US, they have their own. And so mm -hmm. their data sets are available. What we're trying to do is get, at least get some cross-platform of meta, metadata, because they have a two-year closure on, on there. So individually, you can get that data, but on the, their data archives uh, go into into their archives. And the Koreans have set up a database now where you can query it for uh, 
for information and also put your own data in it and get some mapping out of it. And so the, the thing that I've been trying to work through the Arctic Data Center and the NOAA's and CEI is that we have a project landing page for the DBO, you know, for NSF. It's the, the Arctic, the NOAA is planning to do something similar to that is to at least have metafile data that could be standardized that we could actually know where to point you to the data sets and then who to contact. Mm -hmm. So that that's the thing is the internationals, just like we have, have our own requirements of where the data go. Individually, like on the PAG meeting, we saw all this data sets and individually we get connections, but for the general public, we need to be able to have more, more uh, transparent metafiles. Okay. Um, there's a question from Gay Sheffield about how do communities get information about this? I think that's really relevant to the algal bloom research. And I, and I similarly had a question for Mike about how they would distribute predictions about freeze up maybe to community. So if um, Bob or Mike or others um, wanna speak to getting information to, and, and actually maybe we table this one to the outreach. Now that I think about it, let's table that one for the third part. Sorry, Gay, we're, we're going to circle back to it, but we're going to focus on it in the third um, portion. So Shoko in the chat asked who was presenting about the reduced levels of fresh water despite high heat content, and if anyone wants to comment on the driving those trends. I can comment on that. Uh, thank, thanks for the question. So, so that that map of heat content that I that I presented was the heat content integrated over a layer of the halocline, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the layer of the halocline that that is of Pacific origin water. And so, an increase in heat content in that layer means that either the temperature is increasing or its thickness is increasing, or both. And in recent years, we've seen that sort of both of those temperature increases and thickness increases in roughly equal measure. What, at the same time, we can consider a freshwater change in, in large extent in that layer to be driven by uh, a thickness increase. And so that is how one could reconcile a reduction in freshwater while we have an increase in heat would be that we're seeing more increased temperatures rather than a thickening of that layer. And if that kind of broadly makes sense, then, um, then that's a good thing. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Shoko. And I'm gonna, gonna to... oh yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, so yeah, I just, it'd be really interesting. I, I like just like that, the freshwater content decreasing in the Beaufort Jar there, Mary Louise, and be really interested to tie that to mm -hmm. the long-term changes that we've seen in the Bering Strait, because we had a, a large period of freshening, um, which we think shallowed the where the Pacific water ended up in the Arctic. And now the last year, two years, we seem to have gone back to saltier water again, so a lower freshwater flux. It's been really cool to sort of try and pull that budget together. I'd love mm -hmm. to work with you on that. And that maybe will answer the Shoko's question too. All right, I'm going to ask one more question, then we have to move on. Um, I wanted to ask Emily how uh, the Arctic is like a, uh, how the river delta in the Arctic is like a tropical delta. I didn't quite understand how they were similar. Could you explain that to me? We saw Emily. Oh, she's, you know what? She had to drop off early. And I, I saw her on video just a second ago. So I wanted to get my question to her, but I'll ask her separately. All right, that, um, I really appreciate people kind of chiming in there. And that's what we're hoping for as we develop these meetings to, to have a little bit more opportunity for free form dialogue and hey, you know, be good to know this or integrate these pieces of information. So now we're gonna go to our next theme on the challenges encountered in the field. So I think that's you, right? Okay. So it's the same speaker order. Dave, you can call on people. Okay, um, let's go to Karen to kick things off. Okay, um, so challenges for this cruise, it was really, um, the, our biggest challenges I think really were associated with the weather. Uh, we were going into, we were going to the North Pole in um, September and October. We got there on September um, 30th, and so it was cold out. And that meant that the sensors on the CTDs were 
could freeze. It meant that all the hoses were used on deck and also the piping that supplied the water to those hoses would freeze and we had to empty them and drain them all the time. There was ice on the deck. Some of the outflows of water from the ship actually got ice built up on the edge of them and froze. And so that was a little, and sometimes we had a little problem with the heat, but that was a, all a bit of a, those were all challenges that we had to overcome on the cruise. Also, it was very windy at times. And so during, when we were working in open water, it would get windy enough. So we had limitations to um, being able to operate equipment safely. And, and when we were on the ice, when it was extremely windy, that was tough also because the ice would either just move around like mad or it was hard to keep a hole open and the ice would exert pressure and it would just want to close. And when we were doing casts that would last four hours, it's really hard to be able to keep a hole open for that long. We had some other glitches along the way um, that were solved by the, the, the either the Healy crew or the science techs and the science party. So, but that always happens on every cruise. And the only thing, well, the, the, the one thing that was truly broken was the soda machine. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Jackie, sure. you want to jump in? Um, the challenge is that we, for the first time in the years, some 20, nearly 20 years that we've been doing this cruise or 18 was we had high winds in the Cherokee Basin um, that, were, that inhibited us from sampling the, uh, the DVO time series station. So we got three of the four, but we usually have like seven of which we have CGDs. And so that was new. And that's because, you know, the, the ice had been gone and, and we just had a more frequent storms. And it's something that was, uh, was novel for us. Um, we always work long hours because there's not enough bursts in the amount of time you had. And so you need, that's another, just a logistical issue. So it doesn't facilitate shifting. And as a response this year, DFO is going to put forward another on their dime, another support day. Yeah. To start uh, so that we could actually have a downtime on some of those really 36 hour times. So those are our challenges. It's a, uh, was the, was the weather with something that Karen just said. And I think that's an important thing because we ran, we're running into that more often now uh, in the North. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'll turn to Cecilia Peralta Fries and uh, Rebecca Woodgate. Yeah, so I'll follow the theme of weather. The storm, the big 20, September 2022 storm um, was of course a big hindrance to us, but of course we got off very, very lightly compared to what the communities were facing. So I don't really feel I can complain about that. Um, so one of our moorings got dragged a nautical mile by the sea ice, um, and this is a plot of sea ice estimated from our moorings. On the left is what the winter has been the last few years when we're getting median ice thicknesses of you know, half to 0.75 metres. Well, last winter was much thicker than that, and you can see there a keel which is 17 metres deep, and that's what did for our mooring. We can see it being moved along quite nicely by that, but we found that one. I don't know what's happened to the other mooring. As I said already, we're still going to plan a look for that. And the other issue that we faced because of course COVID, which completely mm -hmm. smashed our um, outreach plan in Nome, completely out of court, unfortunately. So those are our, our challenges. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, do you want to follow on, please? Oh, hi, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I, I briefly touched on that in my other presentation, but yeah, the, the, the typhoon did have an impact on our, our survey. We did have a couple of our rosette failed uh, during the survey, so we we were um, uh, real time trying to figure out how to account for that. But, uh, um, and, and there were some COVID related issues that we um, kind of slowed us getting out of that this year. Thanks very much. Um, I'll turn to Karen then please. Okay, yeah, um, a recurrent theme, it was very windy this year. And you know, when you're working on a 43 foot boat, that really kind of limits the days on you could, um, which we could sample. Um, luckily, we did get um, our, our most favorite set in the line sampled, and we did get all our moorings turned around and stuff, but we wouldn't have minded a few more days of data collection. Um, another interesting thing was that we had a broken fuel pump for one of our, en our engines. And the part was uh, located and procured, but it was delayed in shipment because of a delay in backup and cargo coming to Utkiagbik. And this was a problem that plagued the North Slope um, or anyone working out of Utkiagbik for, I think, weeks because they had been working on the runway. And so they didn't have the lights and, and systems in place to land the jets when the weather was kind of was foggy. So um, that we also lost uh, working days because of that. Um, they had figured out how to fix it. 
and we had the part, but the part was in Anchorage and just wasn't getting to Utkiagwik. Right on. Uh, Emily, you want to talk about your challenges? Emily item are you yeah, on? We don't have Emily oh, anymore. She had to leave us. Oh, but good bummer. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll weather, go to yeah. um, uh, Mike. We'll turn to you. Um, uh. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, challenges uh, again. A little bit of rough weather. Um, this was, uh, you know, satellite validation of salinity, and so if you're in the ice, you're not validating satellite salinity. So there was a little more ice time than than we uh, had hoped for um, and poor internet, eh, that was okay. Um, I, I, I think what worked was, um, you know, support from the NIC was great and collaboration with Amos um, as uh, Luke will, will testify to. And uh, we didn't really have any major problems. Okay, uh, I'm next. So um, yes. our big challenge was that uh, we originally were going to be on a single ship for a long cruise with a large science party, a large interdisciplinary science party. Uh, but because of various reasons, um, we had to end up using a, a smaller ship, the Norseman II in particular. So that's why we had to split it up into two legs. Um, and, and, and that's also why we had to focus one leg on the HABs and the second leg on the biogeochemistry. It would have been more ideal to have, you know, the primary focus be everything on one ship, but that's the way it worked out. Um, but I will say, though, that the Norseman II was a, a, amazingly accommodating to us. And you can see, for instance, they installed a new science seawater system for us um, down in the level below the main deck. Um, so, you know, they did everything they could, and we really appreciated that. Um, I will say, since everyone else has mentioned, um, sounding like a broken record with the, with the wind, um, the Norseman II really can't do CDD operations if it's more than about a three or four uh, foot sea state. And, and we had a lot of periods when that was the case. And uh, so we went and actually looked at the ERA-5 um, reanalysis data, and we confirmed that this summer was actually abnormally windy. So it, it, we, we're not we're not all making this up. It was actually uh, windy. But uh, we, nonetheless, when we were operational, we were really fast, and we ended up, you know, uh, making up time that way. Thank you. Oh, I guess I'm next here. Okay, so this was a late season cruise. And so, yes, uh, our biggest challenges were ice uh, during the freeze up, um, but the Sekuliak is amazing about making holes in the ice for the CTD. Uh, unlike what Karen was describing on the Healy, our, our casts were very short. So we were very effective at making the holes and, and good thing, because you know about 90% of our CTDs were done in almost 100% ice. And you can see a picture of that on, on the left, uh, a, a, the ship making a hole for us. Uh, when we were in the Chukchi at the end of the cruise, um, it was uh, weather, uh, wind, and uh, you see a picture of a CTD cast in, in open water. Um, and there we were, I have to say we were lucky in terms of the, of the timing of the storms. Um, we, you know, we had minimal impact, uh, thank goodness, because it's late, late season. Um, so all in all, um, we did really well. Thanks. That rosette swinging doesn't look too, uh, too great, Bob, but thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'll turn to Mike Steele um, now to talk about. Uh, uh... Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah. So uh, challenges, we tried to get real close to uh, Point Hope with one of the sail drones and uh, the Alaskan Coastal Current is a challenge for a, a little sailboat. Um, it tries to sweep it north, northward. So, but the sail drone pilots were really good about uh, using northwesterly winds to uh, manage that. So that, that actually worked a couple of times. And then at the very end, uh, sail drone in 2019, we, we, the whole goal of our sail drone expedition in 2019 was to get near the ice and we got really near the ice and got bashed up a little bit. So they're a little shy of the ice nowadays. And at the very last day uh, on uh, DB06, we got in the ice, um, and but we managed to exit. So uh, that those were our challenges. Thank you. Amazing that you got them to go so close, but I guess it's the name of your project. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, I'll turn to Mary Louise, who doesn't have a slide, but wanted to wanted the floor for uh, for a little bit. Please, Mary Louise. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, well, we didn't have local 
weather challenges too too much, but we did we did suffer the consequences a little bit from mid latitude weather when one of our science personnel his his home was severely damaged in Hurricane Ian and we offloaded him in Utiavik. And then there was a, a massive storm in Newfoundland where many of the crew members on the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker lived. So that was a little bit touch and go. Then we had a, a medevac, which was a wonderful collab, not wonderful, but it was an excellent collaboration between the Canadian Coast Guard and the US Coast Guard. We were on the Canadian Coast Guard ship and the US, our helicopter was out of commission because of issues with Transport Canada had grounded all of their helicopters uh, because of a crash. And the US Coast Guard helicopter came out um, and, and lifted off our our um, sick passenger. So um, that worked very well. And we lost about a day of science, but all was very well and she ended up healthy, so. That's a great, um, a great story. And thanks for sharing that, um, Mary Louise. And now I'll turn to Luke um, for, uh, mm -hmm. for some comments on Amos. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, the reason why we have this meeting is to really emphasize that need for collaborations and working together and I think our cruise was a great example, like Phyllis Tabeno and Catherine Birchok, I think they're on, on the meeting. They can uh, really testify to the fact that things don't always go according to plan. So the Dyson had major uh, medical, me mechanical issues. And before the cruise, we had already agreed to do some work with NOAA. Uh, so we had a couple of people from NOAA uh, aboard Sekuliak, but has their program kind of collapsed because of ship issues, uh, we ended up being able to coordinate and we had the, the resources to take much more of their work. So again, that takes a lot of collaborations and time, but everybody working together, that worked really well. And we ended up uh, doing 10 recoveries and 10 deployments uh, with NOAA. Yep. So that, that was great. Uh, yeah, maybe Phyllis, you want to uh, say something here? Yep. I want to thank you again for uh, the mooring work, um, last minute, et cetera. But yeah, the Dyson lost his starboard engine. And so our cruise was dead just north of Bering Strait. And uh, both uh, Luke and um, uh, uh, Bob both did work for us. And we're very, very thankful. But yeah, it's, it's working together that is what this shit last year taught us is yeah most of us can help out similarly we all looked for uh rebecca's mooring we didn't find mm -hmm. it but we all did look yeah. and it that i think was the big lesson for us last year is you know our allies and friends um can save your bacon yeah. when things yeah. go bad yeah exactly and and i'll, I'll just uh my final uh, comment would be again about the weather and the fact that we had all these these storms going, but uh, again, like Jackie said, it's important maybe to plan a little bit more for these weather days now when we're looking at uh, field work, especially late in the season. But also, it, it presents some wonderful opportunities because this is really important dynamics. And I'll just point out, like uh, uh, we were uh, Sassy uh, was kind of in a region just south of where we were uh, mostly during the Amos cruise. And they sampled kind of the pre-storm conditions. So there was a, a large storm in kind of early October with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, big winds just after Sassy left the region. And then we were able, we had some time and we were able to go and sample, do uh, upper ocean sampling right where they were. So by working together and coordinating a little bit more, knowing where people are at all the times, we can uh, really get data sets that would not be able otherwise, that would not uh, be able to get otherwise. So uh, again, thank you everyone for presenting your work here. Wonderful, wonderful messages. And shockingly, we we're actually caught up on time. So I <laughs> want to turn it over to Renee for Q and A, um, to, so that we can build on some of these yeah. um, some of these themes that we've heard through the presentations. Thanks so much to all the presenters. Yeah, that was great. So a couple of our questions were: um, How did cooperation with other PIs and institutions help your project? And we've heard some examples of that. If people have more examples, we'd love for you to share them. Um, but I think because we're the field operations working group, we're also interested in what other tools would have been helpful to you to help solve some of the issues that you had. Um, was there something you wish that you had access to that would have helped you through some of the difficulties? Go ahead, Karen. 
Well, this doesn't sound funny, but, and it's not really anything you can probably, do, we can do right now, but it's something to think about in the future, but heated decks would be really nice because then we wouldn't have to shovel the snow and get the ice off the deck in order to safely go out and deploy, deploy instruments. And it's just something to think about as we look to mm -hmm. the future. Um, and, uh, and of course, designing a ship that has plumbing all interior um, would have been helpful too. Mm -hmm. And then anything that could be done about cargo, you know, get being able to get access to parts or um, spare science. Some people lost science equipment or it failed. Um, anything there with regard to having access to spare parts or spare equipment? Well, we had spare parts on on the Healy, so mm -hmm. and that was good, except for the soda machine. Um, <laughs> and it, it wasn't perfect. You know, at some time, some of the spare parts weren't as wouldn't work as well as the originals, but yeah. um, that was okay. The, the thing about the the fuel pump, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of things on an, in, yeah. in the boat's engine. The, apparently, this, this this part was about the size of a hot dog, so. The real problem there was the getting the getting it into um to Utkiag, yeah. and and that had that's nothing that we can control. Right, Jackie, did you want to add something? No, oh, sorry, I just had to change uh to my change of venue. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> and then hi, Renee. Uh, oh, go I ahead. Just, I just chime in too that um when we had problems with the with the Dyson um first off um I said it in the chat but thanks to ONR and um, and to, uh, to you, Dub APL for, um, uh, for really helping out, uh, with finding our moorings and, um, and helping us retrieve and deploy. Um, but we also, we, because of, uh, um, Typhoon Murbach, we actually really struggled, um, in real time with whether we should even ask for the parts and or personnel necessary to, uh, to come in while, um, while coastal communities were struggling, um, struggling with the aftermath of the, of the typhoon. And we ultimately decided um, to to cease and desist, and and even considered offloading mm -hmm. some of our provisions because we had to cancel. We ultimately had to cancel the cruise um, uh, because it was just it didn't seem appropriate for us to be worrying about um, the science activity while everyone was struggling so so much. That's interesting. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, let me just say a couple words about ice. So we had a really late season cruise, as as you know, yeah. <laughs> and we had some challenges, and one of them was that one of the Sentinel satellites wasn't working properly. So we we didn't get the number of passes that we would normally get, and that's obviously not in anyone's control here. But maybe it's something to keep in mind. Maybe I should have been paying more attention earlier on to make sure that we can sort of compensate for that. Um, and the other thing that that uh, happened to us is that uh, since we were so late in the season, we were the last cruise up there. Um, we had to go to the Canadian Coast Guard and ask them for some help in, in terms of additional imagery from Radarsat 2. And, and I'm so thankful that they re, re, uh, you know, started again their, their normal uh, service. Uh, so we were able to get a whole bunch of extra imagery that way. Um, but maybe that, again, that's something that, you know, it, 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 especially since the shoulder seasons are getting longer now, we should all do some thinking beforehand about, you know, making sure we're getting the proper ice products. And, and the other thing I'll mention here is that um, one of the amazing things about the Sekuliak is the fact that, you know, there's an extremely talented technician that probably everyone knows who it is, who I'm talking about, who's just an absolute expert with ice imagery and helps guide the ship on, on how to effectively maneuver through the ice. But one person can't do it all, right? So it would be really wonderful to try to, to, to make sure that we have the support um, all the time so that we can have these effective uh, later season cruises. Um, you know, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. It would be really good to have that. Thank you. Those are really helpful insights. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll second that. That was, you know, you, you probably saw it a little bit on the slide that was up for a while, like the support from the National Ice Center and, and good, uh, like, uh, as Bob said, the Sikuliak has, has a one-man team that does it really well, but depends heavily on that one person. And, and it would be great to find ways to share it between projects and between ships. Bob, were you able to get the imagery free of charge or was it just, a, did you pay for it? Uh, yeah. Well, we did, we got it free of charge through the Canadian service, but okay. you know, radar sets not cheap. It's very expensive, yeah. right? And yeah. that's always been an ongoing issue, right? Yeah. And it's just, it would be so great if we didn't have to deal with that constraint. Okay. We do. All right, Rebecca, and then we're gonna close it out and go to the next session. 
changing topic again, I wanted to second Phyllis's comment about um, the community holding together yeah. and thank everyone again who helped us look for our mooring. And to stress um, how useful that table is that Jackie does with all the cruises in it, the DBO list of the cruises, um, which lists who is the contact for all of those things. It's a comparatively simple thing to do, but it's very powerful. Yeah. And I really hope we can continue it. And so, and then IARPIC builds on the list that Jackie puts together of all the Pacific Arctic Group cruises to include, you know, NOAA and NSF, and NASA, and everyone. So, um, we're trying to get the word out more about the cruise matrix that we put together. It's a tool for researchers to use to know who else is going out, but it's also a tool for communities to understand what vessels are coming by and when. So they they see a ship, they know who it is. They could reach out to it if they needed to. Um, and I want to reiterate. In the Arctic, I'm really proud of the culture that we have of helping each other out. Nobody is a, is a gatekeeper or nobody's too busy to help someone else. Um, and I think that's really important to the success of everyone. It's definitely a, um, it's a maritime culture, but I think we have it throughout all of the Arctic research community where, where people will help each other out and um, really uplifted to hear the stories about people helping each other in real time. and. Um, and people being really aware of the impact of Murbach on communities and um, on people who are out on the ocean as well. So thanks everyone for that. And we're going to go to the next session. Awesome, thanks so much for the discussion. Um, this is uh, really exciting. Um, what we're uh, hoping to do now is to turn over to, um, uh, turn to the community engagement and outreach activities. And we'll follow the, sim uh, the same format and first turn to Karen um, to talk about the SAS. Okay, so um, I, I'm, I broadly interpreted community here to include both science and local community. Um, they're both important. Um, as far as local communities go, um, so far, and I'd like to stress so far, um, we've presented information to the AEWC before and after the cruise, and I'm actually going to be um, presenting information at the Whale and Captains Convention um, the week after next as well about the results of what we found. I do plan to do some sort of outreach later as the results become more mature, and I'm happy to have suggestions about what would be a, a great way to do that and which communities would be interested. Um, as far as the internal um, the, you know, the scientific community goes, we've, we've um, presented so far at the Pacific Arctic Group, and I'll be doing a presentation at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium at the Arctic Science Summit Week and at ISR 7. And then for the general public, we did mean, uh, we had a photographer on board and he had a, a blog during the cruise. Um, many people also had informal um, um, things going on. I was distributing letters um, to a large group of people. We had on board also our, um, our research assistant, who is now the president of the SEA, <laughs> Sea Education Association. Um, he was, he's a teacher, um, retired teacher, who um, I've sailed with before, and he came out to help me run my video plankton recorder, but he worked with the with an Ipswich, Massachusetts high school class to discuss science and in, in field questions. And also he was the onboard contact for the float your boat program that we had on board Healy. And this is run a program, an SF funded program by um, Dave Forcucci and Ignatius Rigger. And it involves um, school children coloring boats and then they get deployed on the sea ice with a satellite buoy that tracks where the sea ice is moving. And then the boats eventually get released into the water and some of them actually wash up some places and they hear that that boat is washed up. So it's a way to teach kids about oceanography. So that's what we've done so far, but I'm definitely looking for opportunities to, it, to continue to present information in multiple forums. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I'll turn to, uh, to Jackie now. Sure, if you can hear me fine. I'm sorry for the background noise, I'm in a car right now. Um, just a few points of our community outreach. We do do our presentations for the Alaska Coastal Whaling Commission prior to and post. We had the final one, it was about a month ago, and we uh, presented our, our 223 cruise for the, on the Laurier. Um, we have had talks uh, at the Bering Strait that Gay Sheffield uh, sponsors out of Nome. Um, we, used, we did have our last community visit in St. Lawrence just before COVID started. Uh, then um, we haven't been back to St. Lawrence Island since then, but we hope to reinitiate the coastal community meetings. But while we're in Nome, we also had uh, interviewed with the radio station, had an article in the Nome Nugget. And so I really do have to shout out for Gay's efforts on uh, those facilitating that outreach. 
Um, we do present at national and international meetings. Uh, we have our uh, twice a year Pacific Arctic Group meeting we just had in Victoria, and we had our six DBO data meeting in um, uh, Victoria also. And so those are ways that we do uh, bring forward out, and we hope to continue to get in the place community meetings with the schools. We've done that in the past too, but it, in the last couple of years, haven't been able to do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. I'll turn to Cecilia and Rebecca, please, on the Bering Strait mooring cruise. Yeah, so I interpret this more locally. We, we too have done the um, Pacific Art Group and DBO things, and I'm grateful too for Jackie for always including us in the presentation she does to the um, Wayne Commission and other things like that. Um, our cruise outreach this year got hammered in many ways. Um, COVID meant it hard made it impossible for us to do stuff in known before the cruise. And if that continues to be a problem this summer, I think we need to address other ways of getting outreach to the community there. I'm happy to talk to Gay and others about that later. Um, and then in Seattle, we had this great plan for doing um, live broadcasts from the ship and then the Seattle schools went on strike. But <laughs> we are then, this is looking better for this year and we're getting back into the Seattle schools. So I'm hopeful that this year will be much better for these things than last year. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Karen. I'll turn, uh, or actually, Jim, sorry, I'll turn to you. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so from this survey, we, uh, Dan Cooper, so the, the other Cooper that works up in this area, um, gave a straight science talk uh, with uh, Gay Sheffield on this, the new benthic research um, for the community. And, and I, I, I provided an overview of the survey at the US Canada Joint Technical and, and there were multiple ecosystem indicators that folks provided to the North Pacific Fisheries Survey. Thanks very much. I'll turn to Karen now. Okay. Um, I think I probably didn't include everything on here, but this is for the Point Barrow and, and now the entire Beaufort Shelf um, Bowhead Whale Distribution Study. Uh, again, I presented information to the AEWC before and after the cruise. Um, I am also looking forward to to communicating about this with um, the whaling captains the, at the convention because I feel like I'm kind of out of touch because of COVID. So I'm really looking forward to that and have some good science questions for them. Um, I presented this at the Pacific Arctic Group meeting and I'm doing a poster um, or Steve Okunen is doing a poster at the AMSS next week. Um, Kate Stafford and I um, participated in a traditional knowledge panel at the North Slope Bar Department of Wildlife Management when we, when we were in Utkiagbik doing our field work, and that was really great, a good way to get back in touch with people. And also, I, I guess I should note that I didn't put on here is that every year I am in um, con pretty much regular and constant contact with the, um, the uh, president of the Barrow Whaling Captains Association in Utkiagbik. Um, and so I just write them emails and stuff like that. So. Anyway, so those are some of the things that we've been doing. And again, we keep looking for good opportunities um, to, to share the information about what we've been finding. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I will turn to, I, I think Emily's off of the line. So I'll turn to Sassy, please. Um, and Mike Steele. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, let's see. Uh, we uh, present, uh, Kyla presented some uh, material at the at the whaling commission and uh covid uh, axed uh planned uh interaction with with uh with uh, alaska uh lessons learned was to you know start collaborations and outreach at the pre-proposal stage kyla didn't put on here but uh, she gave a talk at a, a, a mini um polar science uh weekend at our local science museum the pacific science center she gave an invited talk about about sassy there and that's all i have that's excellent. Thanks so much. I'll turn to you, Bob, because um, you you had a pretty extraordinary program and useful to share. Okay, thanks, David. Um, yeah, so we, as I mentioned in the science part of my presentation, we did encounter a, a very extensive harmful algal bloom, and they were concentrations that were uh, of concerning for ecosystem health and, and also human health. So we ended up issuing three different HAB safety alert notifications to various health organizations and communities, and and um, that was a lot of work. 
and 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 I do want to give a, a a huge thank you to Gay and and all the folks that she worked with as well to 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 help us out with with these notifications and also getting the word out to, to the various important stakeholders. Um, we could talk about that more later if you want, um, but it was it was, again it was a lot of work. Um, we in terms of outreach, we had a polar trek teacher on board. Uh, that was a great success. She gave a live presentation from the ship. Um, as chief scientist, I sent out daily updates to various tribal offices for the villages all along the route, you know, all the way from the northern bearing up to Uktiavik. Um, we sent out weekly summaries to the Alaska HAB network. Uh, and lastly here, uh, there's an outreach trip that's planned for, for later this year. Uh, Don and his team are going to visit some uh, villages to talk about the, the, the results from this harmful algal bloom survey that we did. Thank you. Okay, so the other project monitoring the Western Arctic boundary current. So we had an extensive, in terms of outreach, we had an, an extensive educational outreach program on the cruise. Uh, we involved three different schools from diverse parts of the country. Uh, one of the schools was from um, Brevig Mission, Alaska, a remote village. Uh, and we thought that was a good success, uh, really to, 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 to get them talking with us as scientists on, on the ship, but also with each other. Um, and uh, we have a nice uh, a synopsis of, the, of that program. Um, that you can get online. Um, I, I also, again, sent out daily updates to the tribal offices um, for the villages along the route. Um, and I gave a live presentation from the Sekuliak uh, as part of the Straight Science um, sem seminar series. And again, a shout out to, to Gay for, for you know, a really excellent program and, and allowing us the, the opportunity to share our science with the local communities. Thank you. That's great, Bob. Thank you. And I'll turn back to Mike uh, to talk about uh, um, Misty, or maybe, yeah. <laughs> never, never called it Misty. Just Misty. Never called it Misty. Okay, well, sorry. Okay, yeah. <laughs> play, play Misty for me. So, um, anyway, so yeah, we uh, uh, let's see. Uh, we've been in touch uh, with the sail drone cruises for the for these three years, 2019, 2021, and 2022. Uh, been in touch with the whaling commission, make sure that we're we're outside of their waters. Um, in terms of science community collaboration, uh, as I mentioned, we collaborated with DBO this past summer and with NOAA PMEL in their sail drone expedition in 2019. And then I have a whole bunch of, of papers. So that's all I have to say about that. That's great. Thank you. And I'll turn to um, Mary Louise. Um, I I see that you don't have a slide here, but did you want to um, interject with some comments about what you did with the um, Canadian Coast Guard? Yeah, sorry, once again, I don't, don't have a slide. Um, we did, yes, we did uh, presentations to the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission um, and some of these other um, similar activities, uh, the PAG presentations and so on. Um, I'm excited to learn about straight science. That is a good one. We had um, undergraduate and, and graduate students on board and two Yale graduate students wrote daily dispatches and they had a very broad network that they were communicating with. Um, that's all I can remember right now. Thanks. That's awesome, Mary, Mary Louise. Thank you so much. And I'll turn to Luke finally to talk about Amos outreach. Yeah, so on, on the same theme, uh, you know, making sure that the, our planets are clear to the AEWC, so presenting there. And also before each cruises, we always uh, send emails and also try to make phone calls to uh, the list of the commissioners and, and people in the communities to know where we're coming. And as, as the cruise evolves, as we go, just like Bob uh, uh, said, we can send, uh, we send daily emails uh, about where we are, what we're doing. And I, I'll tip my hat here to UAF. Uh, they have a great person coordinating all of this and making sure that the list is accurate and prompting us, prompting us when we, where we're not so good at, at sending some emails and some updates. Uh, so it's really nice to have that support from uh, from the Sequoia group. Uh, so again, big uh, good communications with the communities, and also uh, in in the case of the Sequoia, we had uh, marine protected species observers with us. Uh, so really looking at this. And we uh, we worked with uh, both NOAA and and also as part of our program, we put uh, acoustic uh, sensors, specific acoustics recorders on the shelf to make sure that uh, the acoustic navigation array and, and things that we do up in a deep basin and far away from the coast is not uh, like, does not make it to the shelf. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'll turn now to Renee to, um, uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for these um, really thoughtful, um, thoughtful presentations on your outreach. 
and um, uh, and thanks also for the the thought and um, and effort that's involved in actually doing doing that work uh, both before, during um, or before, during, and after um, your research activities. Um, I'll now turn it to Renee to um, to uh, lead the Q and A. Yeah. Um, does anyone have questions already that they want to ask of one another? Um, because I'm I'm interested to know what people felt were yeah, like important feedback that they got from communities or you know things that they might do differently based on you know that interaction that you had with communities. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, thanks, Renee. Um, so as I mentioned, I uh I sent out these daily updates and um we did get some feedback, uh, not a lot, but we got some feedback, and we sent it out to a, to, a, to a large group of people, um, and uh, so I hope it was helpful. Um, and and we certainly responded to the feedback that we got. You know, uh, like for instance, um, you know, community uh, asking whether we can you know take measurements near their town, for instance, uh, you know, with the harmful algal bloom uh, study that we did. But I but I do have a question. I, you know, I. I'm just trying to think about the uniformity of, of of our approach here, right? So, so I was out at sea a lot this summer, and I wrote a lot of daily updates, and um, and I see, you know, Luke, you did the same, but but I'm wondering, are, were we all doing this, or should we all be doing this? Like, if if we're all doing this, then we're probably going to overwhelm the system, right? We're going to overwhelm the communities and 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 the, and the folks who who want to hear from us. So, I think we need Is to do that. Something. That or we're creating a shift log. Uh, you know, that could be, you know, like if you coalesce all the different cruises across time, you may, you, you might even find other interesting interactions. I, I think that's a good question. Karen and then Gay. Yes. Yeah, so, so Bob, you know, I've done that for years, um, but it was interesting. This cruise for the, on the, I'm talking about the Healy cruise now, when, um when I talked to the AEWC, they were interested, but they, they weren't concerned at all. And uh, they didn't really leap to the idea of bringing a community observer or or even, you know, press for for that kind of daily communication. And, and we also had the additional um, addition, you know, on the on the Healy this year, I would have had to run that through somebody every time I wrote it, too. So that was could have been I, I was kind of glad I didn't have to do it this year, but we were operating really, really far away from. Um, from the coast. And we did go to Utkiagvik to pick up um, some people for the Coast Guard at the beginning. And that's when, and I did write to people in Utkiagvik and the Coast Guard also had their own communication with the local community about how we were going to come along and take our, put our boat in, and then we were going to take these people on board and then we were going to go away. And so <laughs> it's really different because usually I yeah. do exactly what Bob talks about, but this mm -hmm. time they're just, they just sort of smiled and said, have a great cruise. So, yeah. uh, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, I think it was in part because it was, it was so far away. Right. And so I think if I was certainly, if I was operating close by, like you were, especially Bob, your cruise, my God, what a great opportunity for outreach when you're looking for Habs. I mean, that's really great that you did that. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I just, I just think it's, it depends on the cruise. Right. Go ahead, Gay. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you everybody who who said something nice about straight science. I appreciate that. There are so many points I can make, but I guess I don't know what our time is, but if it's a minute, um, I would say to answer Bob's question was why do this? And I think I've heard all along and it's been wonderful, like the maritime research community, everybody's helping find a piece of equipment, everybody's pulling together, allies and friends will save your bacon. All those that integrating into the coast is a really um, that's a beautiful ending goal. And I guess the the to answer Bob's question as why to write all these things and are we overwhelming communities? What it used to be, and I'm old, so what it used to be was there was a lot more conflict with maritime subsistence and maritime research at sea. What just as a point of order is that. Has anyone looked to see communications have gone up? What has maritime conflict done? Yeah. That should be just a little lesson as 
people want to know people want to know and and we can take it further there's a lot more to go but just as a as a thing keep writing keep communicating yeah. and do know that for like the work that Karen the awesome work that these guys are doing up in the Beaufort Chuck Chi North Pole oh, holy cow Karen um <laughs> is you know that's really applicable to the Beaufort Sea Coast absolutely to everybody but especially to the Beaufort Sea Coast know that within the strongest thing I could end with on this and I'd love to talk more is that the each region and we the coast of northern and western alaska revolves around six or er, what we would call urban six communication and transportation hubs that's all that is where all comms are revolving around and what you're doing in, in with the aewc reaches 11 communities in three different regions um, but it's not comprehensive for those two other regions. It's comprehensive in the North Slope Borough. So I just wanted to make a point that it's best to integrate, as a lot of people here do an awesome job of that. And please know that regional communications at the hub level are incredibly important. You want to integrate with the hub. You want to make sure that the hub communities and and each regional communication network, because they're different. Um, you know, if you're working in that region, that's how I would sort of start to look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, thanks. Thank you, Gay. Very interesting meeting. Yeah, and I, I mean, I I agree. And and one of our other questions for folks was, did you, as a result of your communication with communities, make adjustments to your cruise track or other sampling plan, you know, to avoid conflict? Um, a lot of a lot of cruises are being planned with the subsistence activities in mind, and we're intentionally staying away from that. So there's less having to resolve in more real time or or just ahead of the field season. Um, but curious if anybody had to make changes. Go ahead, Karen. Um, not not this year, but I just want to point out that the whole timing of my field season for the Point Barrow work is is based on avoiding conflict with yeah. subsistence hunting. Yeah, I think we've really made huge strides with our cruise track planning to avoid major subsistence activities. I think the communication has gone way up. Um, it used to be just one or two people doing it. Now it's become routine. And it you know, gets back to those principles for conducting research in the Arctic that people want to know what you're going to do. And they want you to come back and tell them what you did, bring some research results to their community. And something that comes up in the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission meetings and other meetings is, you know, isn't all this work redundant? And how does this relate back to our subsistence species, which are many? And, you know, yeah, bowhead whales and, and seals, but also other, um, you know, Gay can speak in greater detail about all the different things that people are collecting in the Bering Strait region. But I, I, I'm hoping that through these meetings and through a little, with a little bit more effort, we can synthesize some information and have a better answer at an AEWC meeting for how all of this relates together and isn't redundant, but is in fact creating a, you know, a, improving our knowledge in a broader scale and across time and relating back to important subsistence species. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, yeah, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say, uh, Gay, uh, in terms of he hearing from the communities and, and reacting out at sea, um, I actually, the only request we got were to, to actually take measurements somewhere where they yeah, wanted them. That is great. It was, it was really great to, to, yeah. to get that feedback. That's yeah. one thing I want to say. And the other thing that I wanted to say was something that Luke mentioned about who we are reaching out to. And he talked about UAF and, and, and folks there having a list to help. So for us, you know, we were a little bit uh, confused about who we should be reaching out to. And, and as you probably know, we had a community observer on our cruise, on our fall cruise. And that community observer did a lot of legwork to try to figure out, you know, the, the tribal offices, the point of, points of contact, to who to reach out to. Again, Gay, you helped a lot with that. But I felt it was a little bit ad hoc. And, and, and suppose a, a young investigator is coming in next summer, where do they start? So it would be kind of good to get this a little bit more, you know, solid. Yeah, and we're, oh, go ahead, Gay. I agree. And, and it depends. And I, I, it's a bigger discussion. But I agree. I mean, the fact that you certain funders are sort of cutting researchers loose on in these regions with no um, assistance. So you and I and I have to say, Bob Picard did a really good thing by hooking in 
regionally. He came in, he was doing work in Nome. He hooked in with multiple entities in Nome, like Norton Sound Health Corporation, um, because he was doing HABs. When there turned out to be a direct threat to human health, that is when, um, you know, thank goodness Bob had contacted prior to the cruise, you know, and had a bit of a game plan on what would what would happen and check that game plan in a hub. And because of that, I think there's a whole nother story about how that unfolded. And I think it unfolded in the best way possible, given what we had to go with. Your observer, I know it's very interesting because he was very AEWC uh, minded and that's good. That's what he was for. And I guess I would ask one thing that really helps is if we ask the question to the researcher, or maybe the question goes bigger up the food chain, I don't know, but what is the objective of your outreach? And these are not to be answered here, but what is yeah, the objective yeah. of your outreach? And and what is success look like? Yeah. Is it conflict mitigation? That's fine. Then I would say success has been occur has been occurring. But is it to really understand the regional networks, how to most effectively and get down into the communities? And is it to sort of lift up the communities with this education and opportunities for furthering in different programs or anything like that, or becoming better at understanding basic science needs yeah. and things like that? That's a question that people need to talk about. Maybe bef that's a bigger question. And being yeah. able to answer what success looks like gives you uh, a path on how to get there. And so I, I, that'd be my only word on that. All right, we're gonna close this session out. I think that there, you know, maybe some things we capture uh, following this meeting about some good practices. And you've seen a poll has popped up. We have a couple other questions we're gonna ask you before we wrap up um, to help inform us about this process that we're doing. And I'm gonna turn it over to Allison Gaylord, who is going to talk about visualization tools for where cruises are, and maybe even we'll touch on how we can provide resources for people to do better outreach in the Arctic. Go ahead, Alice. Uh, thanks, Renee, for the opportunity. Um, can you see my screen? We got you. Okay, great. Um, this is a visualization that of uh, that's been put together actually for several years, but we've just reskinned the interface. We're calling this the Research Cruise Viewer. Um, it's an interactive map that includes current positions, planned cruises, and previous cruises. And we've included some additional information in here for reference, like the active communication zones uh, near the coastal villages of Alaska and the EEZ. And we're hoping that this will be a nice complement to the IORPIC uh, matrix for helping to visualize and do an annual look back, but also forecasting where um, these planned routes are going to happen. Um, let's see with that. I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse of this tool. This is going to be released um, soon through the uh, Battelle Arctic Research Gateway website. It has the ability to show the current positions for the vessel. So if you click on any of the chevrons, you'll get that information. The map view is synced with uh, the calendar. So the start dates and end dates will change what's viewed on the screen. You can filter the vessels by name. Um, you can navigate, zoom in, pan around. Um, you can use a search function to get a quick idea of PIs that are in here, maybe um, keywords such as DBO or mosaic. Um, and again, you have to be make sure that your, your dates are set to see planned cruises for 2023. Um, the planned information will be represented as a dash line and approximation of where um, the proposed route will be going, and then you can view some information about that. And this is largely captured from the, the planning matrix and then integrated into the NSF logistics database. Um, this tool also has just a quick measuring distance from the shore capability, and um, you can download a PowerPoint slide or an image in a format that'll fit nicely into a PowerPoint slide as needed. Um, so we'd love to have some folks help web usability test that. Um, I just wanted to mention um, some of the sources of information that are going into this uh, effort. Um, we've been leaning heavily on the IARPIC vessel matrix. That's been a huge resource for finding out who's doing what um, in the planning stages. 
Um, for vessels that we're tracking through the season, um, we're using real-time satellite-based um, AIS through an API that's programmed. And, um, and for archived information in the past, we had used the Marine Exchange of Alaska and R2R, but often the sources of information that we can get out of the archive um, take too long to actually inform um, the communities in, in a timely manner. Um, going forward, we think that the U Knowles Marine Facilities Planner is going to be a key resource. Um, we've been able to pull for 2023 the planned routes for the Sekuliak, or at least I should say the, the planned sampling sites, and we're inferring approximate routes based on that information. And then that information is going into um, the NSF Logistics Database. Um, I could go into a bit more detail, but I don't know how much time I've got. Um, yeah, just, Allison, uh, yeah. Just you're probably going to cover this, but um, to Bob's earlier question, I want all the ADCP data. Is it easy to you know sort of click on a, a link that takes you to more project information with say who is collecting ADCP data? Something like um, that. We've got information to link to a project website or to the, we prefer to link to the NSF Arctic Data Center's data portal pages. For instance, like with the DBO where they've got a D, they've actually got a portal page. That's the best way to go. And I, and I think to leverage existing resources as much as possible. And um, there's quite a bit of movement in the community of standardized metadata to have it, more information about where those buoys are, where the moorings are, that type of thing. And so through USAON and SAON, we've been very involved in discussions and trying to support uh, the development of uh, uh, a metadata spec specifically for, for sharing that information that then could be linked to the uh, data set of portals. And then, yeah, we can integrate it here. Ignatius, go ahead with your question. Yeah, so um, this is looks like it's focused mostly on ships. Would aircraft deploying and landing on the ice be appropriate? Um, we haven't uh, planned for that yet, but we could certainly include aircraft in here. Yeah. Yeah, because I could, you know, at least for the flights we're involved in, I'd be happy to share that info. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, if we've got to start, you know, points of where, where it's going, sure. We, we're kind of building out what's called a journey module within the logistics database. And so pulling this information from different sources. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll share it with you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Um, so this looks really, actually, it looks kind of similar to something that was being um, run by, um, oh gosh, was it Axiom in, in Anchorage? Oh, yeah. years ago? Anyway, mm -hmm. um, it's a good resource, but one thing, I, I, I want to just want to see if you can work on is to make sure it's not too bandwidth hoggy mm -hmm. because not every place has has excellent internet even now and um maybe some of the some of the more remote communities don't or maybe even my house in New Hampshire doesn't I can tell you it certainly has worth worse internet access than the Healy does mm -hmm. um and so you know you won't this tool won't be as useful if it's so big to get across the internet that you can't actually load anything and take a look at it so i don't know if you use a way to make that you know happen that it's not really that doesn't need a lot of bandwidth and, and upload speed to look at it yeah no, that's a point well taken i i completely understand we, we keep getting requests to add more information and i keep saying well we've got to make sure this isn't lightweight enough that this can be pulled up in in upiavik and other communities um, and is this have. Allison, will this one have a, a telephone um, or, a, you know, where you could use it on the phone? Is this one that's slated to have that interface? Yeah. So right now we have not optimized for uh, mobile uses, but yeah, mobile it can be. You. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it'll, it'll load, but um, we okay. need to optimize it. Okay. Mike Steele. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th this, this seems great. Um, but, you know, honestly, what I was thinking uh, was just uh Jackie's wonderful chart with another column that was just a list of uh, observations taking. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, super dumb, just text, just a table yeah. that was just like, what's what everybody is doing this year or post cruise, post field season, what everybody did mm -hmm. and uh, when they were there, where they went and what you know, uh, did they do a CTD, did they have oxygen, did they do bio, whatever yeah. they did, just yeah. that, just text. 
I think and you know, I, I think we could add a column to the matrix that captures the variables that people are focusing on. Um, that's a good suggestion. I think Easily. there's still some utility to having uh, being able to visualize where cruises are going and use that as an access point, you know, to click on it and and dive down into a record that has more information. Can I can I can I ask as, as follow up? Um, yeah. There's a lot of discussion about um, pre cruise cruises, like and and it's very useful. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going here. Where 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 is someone going nearby? And and uh, you know, local community uh, use of this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about you know the grad student who went on the cruise for the first time, and. Uh, would like to know, like with like Luke was talking about with Amos and Sassy. Oh, there was a cruise a month earlier uh, that that uh, could help mm -hmm. me understand the observations that we took that month later. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what does IARPIC do with the the results of of what we're t talking about today? Is there um, what, what what's what happens after this meeting? Is, is there some is there some product that a student could use? Well, the it's recorded. And so you could certainly parse through it and look for the things that you're looking for. And the uh, slides will be available separately as a download. Oh, cool. And we haven't thought beyond that in terms of what would be useful product. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that this, that the, what you just said should be advertised on, um, on uh, Arc Arctic Info and, yeah. and other things like that. Okay, that's great. And you know, um, Allison, did you cover everything you wanted to cover? Or do you have any other? Um, I could step through a couple more here. I mean, I, I guess I was just gonna Because we're in the sort of wrap up phase. So before I switch to that, I just wanted to make sure if there's anything else. Do you have one slide on the outreach community? Um, how people can contribute? Oh, actually, let's hit that. <laughs> let's uh, hit, yeah. How do you get Allison the information she would like? So she um, clicks you in. Yeah, I think I'll run through the Arctic, the research support contract that NSF has with Patel, and Allison is doing work via that mechanism. And uh, I asked her to put in some information so that people would know how they could provide her with information. And it doesn't only have to be NSF cruises. We will it be happy to include any and all cruises funded by different agencies, anything that's contributing to our understanding of the Arctic? So the matrix is a tremendous resource and I would definitely lean heavily on the matrix, but I think in the future, there's an opportunity to put more, to pull more from the UNOS Marine Facilities Planning Tool mm -hmm. or other like NOAA's implementation of this. Um, right now, I mean, this is tracking the UNOS vessels, but they'll allow access for other um, entities to put information in here. So this was tremendous, but we can only use this for the Sekulia for 2023 so far. Um, I'm going to skip over this stuff since we've kind of covered that. I wasn't sure what kind of internet I was going to have here. Um, the thing that with the matrix, though, like a just last night, I was asked to track a vessel called Ocean Cat. And I started looking for it. Um, <laughs> and there's a bunch of them out there. So we really need an identifier included in the matrix for the vessel. Um, the IMO or the MMSI would be ideal. And then we can start tracking with AIS. We know we're tracking the right ship. Um, the Including the NSF award number or agency project number would be great. So that if we are going to include this in the NSF logistics database, we need to have a number. Otherwise, we're just going to randomly assign something if we can't find it on the internet. But if you could add the vessel identifier and the agency project number to the IRPIC spreadsheet, that would be super helpful. And if there could be just even a checkbox, like this is a, a this is a route that we're going to repeat, or we're repeating last year's route, mm -hmm. um, then we, we've got a better idea of where the boat's actually going. Um, and then I know in the past, I've submitted information like on the Mosaic cruises and the supporting vessels to the matrix, but they weren't accepted. Or I, And I, this is just a question. I mean, I'm guessing maybe it was out of scope to include the international vessels, but um, mm -hmm. is that um, is that planned or which is it is the matrix limited just to Alaskan waters? It doesn't have to be. It has been that that has been the focus, but I think we've had more interest in hey, what's happening in the eastern Arctic as well. So I think maybe for 2023 that should be a goal. And we could kind of call it out separately so it's not lost in the in the matrix. Okay. 
So, so my recommendation to, in order to get information to me would be to keep that uh, matrix updated monthly because that's what we're looking at. All right. And then we work closely with Polar Field Services, who's going through the environmental compliance checklist, yeah. and, and they're pulling information as well. So if we could pull from the matrix, pull from the UNOLs, um, that okay. would help. Um, All right. So we're going to turn now to some poll questions. Thank you so much, Allison. And sure. this is captured in the recording and in the slide so people can reach out for more information or if they have suggestions. Um, there is a one poll question that's been put up, David. Is it done? And do we should we do the next one? I want to get some feedback before we know people need to sure. That was my my amateur mistake. I, <laughs> I launched the polls like way too early. I didn't know I had such control of the universe. So yeah, let's <laughs> let's go ahead and let's go ahead and let it let it happen in a more orderly pro process now. All right, I'm relaunching the poll. You have the con, Cindy. All right, so we were asking everyone what month would you think that a pre-field season meeting would be helpful? This is where you can talk about what your plans are, opportunity to ex exchange information with people, um, find out who's doing what. Uh, we're hoping to get more community participation. And uh, it, for a variety of administrative reasons, it ended up being in June last year, but we think earlier is probably better, but wanted to hear from you all. And I, I'm seeing that leaning toward April. May ish. Okay. And there's a second. Oh, is this? I'll have all the questions in it at once. You have to scroll down. Aha. So there's a second question on the post field season meeting. We had planned to have it in November, but you know, there's AGU holidays, all kinds of things that ended up being in January. It's close to the AMSS meeting. So we're thinking about, should we try to dovetail those things? And um, so you can select yes, no, or unsure to question number two about um, maybe having a session at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. And the third question, was this format useful? Did you like this sort of talking about each theme at a time instead of just having each presenter present their whole thing start to finish. Um, so it seems like this, I, I really got, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed the opportunity to take a deeper dive and uh, have each person kind of focus on the different things that we were looking into and different meetings will hopefully have different themes that we want to focus on. I gained a lot of insights from this on how we can do better um, coordination and uh, you know, good practices that we can share. And um, so we just have a couple of minutes left. I know we want to say thank you to everyone who presented. Um, we didn't get every single project, but everyone is welcome. So maybe in the, in the pre and post field seasons in 2023, um, we can make sure people get included who wanted to be. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Dave and Cindy, in case there's any other closing remarks you want to make. Cindy, any additional closing closing remarks that we should um, that we should offer? I think that's it, really. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and definitely, this is not obviously all of the activities happening in the Arctic, right? And this is in the goodness of heart of all the volunteers who wanted to share their research uh, with us. So I, I hope that this is a good start for you know upcoming uh, pre-field and post-field sharing with the community. And yeah, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. And yeah, I just wanted to reiterate the thanks um, and particularly um, Cindy was doing this as a Canals Fellow. Um, she uh, jumped into this and was super excited about the project. And I think she brought us to a whole new place um, with so many different innovative ideas as well as um, uh, incalculable energy that she dedicated to really getting us um, getting us where we needed to be, not just throwing the ideas out, but actually doing doing a lot of background work. So I want to I want to um, offer my heartfelt thanks uh, to Cindy for the extraordinary work that that she has done, and I look forward to working with her wherever, um, whatever new awesome thing that she that she uh, lands on doing. Um, and I also want to thank all of our presenters um, as well as all of our uh, collaborators. Um, uh, this just is emblematic of what an what an extraordinary community, it's such a such a collaborative community. Um, 
across the board from the military all the way down to the um, uh, down to the university collaborators um, and uh, just an amazing thing and really appreciate you bearing with us on this experiment. I think we can declare it a, a success and <laughs> um, and maybe close for the close for now. Yeah. And if Danielle, <laughs> Jackie or any of the other uh, sponsoring co-chairs want to add anything, please feel free to jump in. Thank you very much. All Just right. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.